Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Classics Revisited webinar series. We are so happy to be continuing this great conversation and providing a work break with more great titles of our world. Last week, we were able to host uh, Dr. My or Professor Michael Segrew's Reflections on the Philosophy of Utilitarianism by John Stuart Mills. We had pre-recorded his lecture, and at the last minute, we were able to host a live Q&A session for those who could attend on May 4th. I wanted to just record a couple of slides prior to that lecture, just so people would know what was going on. Published his papers in 1861 and turned into a book in 1863, Utilitarianism is a classic defense of the use of utility in ethics and morality. We are excited to deep dive into these thoughts and uses and discuss the merits or dangers of this way of thinking. I would like to once again uh, introduce Professor Michael Segrew. For those of you who have listened to our lectures before, he is our lead professor and historian as we go through these great novels. For those who don't know him, Dr. Segrew, a professor, is a graduate of the Great Books Program. He earned his BA in History from the University of Chicago and his MA, Masters of Philosophy and PhD in History from Columbia University. Professor Segru has taught at prestigious universities such as Princeton, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, and many more. My name is Christy Goebel. I'm a global marketing specialist here at Biblioteca. And as always, I have the great thrill of talking to the professor during our Q&A sessions, of which you will listen to later on. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Michael. Once again, we did pre-record the lecture as well as did manage to record the live Q&A at the end. I hope you do enjoy this great take on utilitarianism. And as always, feel free to leave comments below if you would like to learn more about future webinars. Thank you so much. John Stuart Mill's essays, uh, which taken together form a sort of pamphlet-sized book called Utilitarianism, um, published in 1861 in serial form, uh, is one of the landmarks in political and social theory. And it has much to be said for it. It's a very straightforward and easily understandable way of uh, describing and understanding uh, law and uh, questions of how people ought to behave, ethics. Um, Mill was a utilitarian, and that means that he thinks that society and individuals should try and create the greatest good for the greatest number. And unpacking that, what Mill thinks of as being good is the same thing as pleasure. In other words, uh, Mill is a hedonist, and this is a tradition that's very old and very, res very respectable. Goes back to the ancients, certainly to Lucretius, but also to Epicurus. <coughs> and uh, Mill wants to democratize and optimize hedonism. In other words, he's living in the 19th century. It's the age of industry. Uh, it's the age of mass production and standardization. It's uh, also an age of democratic egalitarianism. It's the age, you know, it's the century in which slavery was abolished. And so, uh, and at least in part because of utilitarian arguments. So what the utilitarian wants is to create the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And by good or hap happy, he means pleasant, all right? So if you can imagine uh, uh, an economist graph, what he's trying to do is optimize the distribution of pleasurable things and minimize the uh, unpleasant things. Now, this quantified and optimized happiness um, makes a certain degree of sense um, when you're doing, for example, calculations about public policy. At least some forms of public policy, it makes good sense. 
Uh, if you're trying to figure out how to allocate funds for fighting disease, you might well ask, well, how many people are affected by a particular disease and uh, how dangerous or lethal it is and uh, how, you know, how much we can expect to achieve by attacking that particular problem. And what any magistrate would properly do is give money to diseases that affect very large numbers of people in a very dangerous lethal way, which is why I suppose that uh, uh, research funding on COVID of late has been much greater than research funding on headaches. It's not the headaches aren't bad and in some cases debilitating, it's just that we, have, we achieve a much greater good for a much larger number of people if we focus our resources in the pharmaceutical industries on COVID-19. So far, so good. I mean, it's a reasonable and practical way of resolving otherwise perhaps difficult moral and political decision making. Now, this works some of the time. There are other times, as in the case of every other theory of politics or law or ethics, where you're left wondering, is it the universal solution to these problems. In other words, it's clear enough that utilitarian thinking has important practical uses. <coughs> Any of you that have ever done a cost benefit analysis have been practical utilitarians. How much bang for the buck do you get? That's actually a very sensible idea. The reason why is that utilitarianism assumes that we operate under conditions of scarcity. In other words, there's always a disjunction between what we want and the resources we have to satisfy our desires. So the utilitarian asks, how can we deploy our limited resources to maximize and optimize our collective enjoyment of these resources. So the problem is that because our resources are limited, we're going to have to say no to some. What we want to do is winnow out uh, those to reject that offer the a lesser advantage to a smaller number of people. Now, although there are many difficulties with utilitarianism, um, one of the problems that, you, that we are going to have in offering criticism to it is that the utilitarian says, well, look, if you have a problem with creating the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people, um, do you prefer to create a smaller amount of good for a lesser number of people? Because that's what the alternative would inevitably be. And that's a pretty good argument. It's, it's worth looking at the dangers there. But uh, the problem with utilitarian, or well, there's a number of problems. The first is that it's essentially consequentialist. So John Stuart Mill thinks you judge an action, good or evil, on the basis of the consequences. Um, other writers on, on morality say, well, maybe the consequences aren't always the only or even the most important thing, uh, maybe people's intentions matter for something, not just the outcome. And there's a plausible enough argument for that. Uh, John Stuart Mill is very sensitive to criticism. And so he's trying to seal off his uh, construction that we should pursue the greatest good for the greatest number by uh, proving or at least giving us good reason to believe that uh, both uh, religion and cultural tradition and logic itself uh, approve of the idea that we should create the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Now, what he gives us is one of the funniest wrong arguments in the of the 19th century, which is an 
a century that produced some howlingly bad arguments. Um, Mill does a sleight of hand, and I don't think he knew that's what he was doing. In other words, he dealt himself from the bottom of the deck, as some intellectuals will, but I don't think he was conscious of it. I think that he just elided the difference between two meanings and then was satisfied that he had sort of proven that everybody should be a utilitarian. Here's the proof, okay? Or what we might call a quasi-proof. If you, if you wanna know why people should pursue optimum pleasure, the answer is because if you look around in the world, people do desire pleasure and things that are desirable or the things that are desired, and we know that pleasure is desired, um, are desirable. And since they're desirable, well, understandably people would pursue what's desirable. And <laughs> this is a, a pretty bad, badly flawed argument. The idea is that he is trying to show that the fact that people desire something shows it to be desirable in the sense that the fact that people see something proves it to be visible or the people or the fact that people hear something proves it to be audible but we are not talking about whether a thing has the capacity to be desired um, mass murder has the capacity to be desired but it doesn't follow from that in the normative sense that it's desirable to murder huge numbers of people. So here, desirable means ought to be desired, not is empirically desired, because empirically people desire both uh, virtue and vice. And if you're going to take as a license the empirical world, it's going to also license whatever vice you find. The fact that people desire to do vicious things doesn't prove that vicious things are desirable, not in the normative sense. It does prove the desirable in the empirical sense that, yeah, people desire to murder one another. It doesn't follow from that that it's moral good or that it's a proper moral object of action. So um, Hume, uh, Mill's argument for the desirability of the ends that utilitarianism says we ought to desire. Um, he really never manages to jump the bridge of that Hume constructed uh, a century earlier of how you distinguish ought from is, right? Um, he takes note of the fact that people desire pleasure, which is in a broad general sense true. But then he tells us that everybody ought to desire pleasure and then he's lost or any way of explaining why people ought to do that. Since, well, all you can see is that people desire pleasure. However, uh, regrettably, um, Mill doesn't see the limitations of his own argument. One of the funniest parts of, the, of his book is where he tries to defend himself against being godless, saying that in fact, utilitarianism is the spirit of the gospels and that Jesus was a utilitarian. Well, that's one of the strangest readings of the Bible uh, of the 19th century. Uh, unless I'm mistaken, it was Pilate who said, uh, it is better that one man die than that many should die because he wanted to avoid a riot. And I thought that actually Pilate was endorsing a kind of a utilitarian maxim there. Uh, finding that same utilitarian maxim in Jesus, uh, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem very plausible to me. Now, in a broad general sense, there's useful stuff you can do with utilitarian thinking. Cost-benefits analysis, cost-benefit analysis, for example. Or there are many cases in the military where it is necessary to sacrifice a part in order to save the whole. And uh, what that means is that um, it may be necessary to engage in dangerous or even lethal conduct and uh, that this may be the best for the group as a whole, even though it is not for a certain portion of individual soldiers. Um, 
what I mean, so you, you can do some crude calculation that it's better to lose 10 men than 100. Fair enough. Uh, you know, generals will have to do that. But uh, beyond that, it's a bluff. It's a kind of blunt instrument. And here's why. Um, we would like to be able to quantify happiness. And if you're going to do the utilitarian calculation, you're right, of putting so much in one side of the scale and so much in another, um, you need some unit of happiness and some way of measuring those things, right? Like a, a Geiger counter for radioactivity. Um, the problem is that there's no such thing as British happiness units, although there are British thermal units because heat um, is an objective thing in a way that happiness isn't certainly. Uh, the things that make people happy are actually rather various. Um, granted, people don't enjoy pain, but there may be times when uh, steadfastness in the face of pain may be the morally proper thing to do. Um, in the end, Mill tries to retort to the claims that there's that his ideas will force people to do things that are inconsistent with ordinary understandings of justice. And that, I'm afraid, fails. Um, there are lots of nightmare cases for utilitarianism. Um, to be fair, there are plenty of exceptional pro rules, exceptional issues for other systems of uh, morals and politics, but um, the ones in utilitarianism are particularly glaring. Let's take something like witch burning, all right? If you are living in an illiterate feudal society and your crops have failed for two years, someone may decide that their cow was hexed by the lady next door that keeps all the cats. And he may accuse her of being a witch and because they're so frightened and they're so frustrated the villagers all decide yeah she's a witch let's burn her unfortunately they are required to take the witch to the king accuse her uh have a trial and only then can she be burned the villagers bring the old lady without her cats to the to the court the king says, why is she here? And the answer is because she killed someone's cow and she's also cast spells on the society, on the land, which is why all the crops have failed for the past two years. She's causing our children to starve and we must burn her. Now, the king may say, that's not so. Um, witches can't actually kill animals or crops. But he may also have a large number of discontented, angry, threatening people. If a uh, 1,000 people or 10,000 join this throng and demand that the old lady be burned, uh, there may emerge a very strong utilitarian case for setting the old lady on fire. Now, this is given the fact that we know she hasn't done anything wrong and that witchcraft doesn't really kill cows and make crops fail. But the fallout, the civil discord, the riots in the streets and the calling out of the army to put down the riots, um, the amount of destruction and, and death that that may cause may be many times the single life of this pathetic old woman. Now, different moral traditions going to look at that differently. The utilitarian is going to say, look, at some point, you got to sacrifice the old lady. You know, do the math. The, uh, the Kantian, for example, would just say, shake his head and say, no, um, that's what's wrong with utilitarianism, right? Here you have a system of justice, which says that every once in a while, it's a good idea to punish the innocent. Kant says, let me help you out here. We don't punish innocent people, not knowingly. And if you do punish innocent people, 
you're doing what you know is wrong. Don't give me any nonsense. Kant is a real hardliner when it comes to morals. Uh, that kind of insistence on individual rights independent of the rights of, well, the collective or the advantages of society is one of the most contested domains, one of the most contested borderlands in political philosophy. If you think about somebody like John Rawls, right, certainly his work, um, it, which is a reaction against utilitarianism, is trying to justify a very robust and extensive idea of individual rights as against the utilitarian calculation, which says, look, every once in a while, people are expendable. The retort, and let's be fair to the utilitarians, is this. If grandma is not, uh, or if the old lady is not expendable, are, say, a thousand people who are going to be killed in this riot expendable? Uh, if we up the numbers to 10,000, um, are they expendable? Is there no number where it begins to suggest itself to you that maybe we're better off not killing, say, a million people to protect this old lady who's accused of witchcraft? This is where things get very tricky. Um, we know it's wrong to burn her at the stake. Um, if you're going to require moral perfection, we don't do it at any price. There's a different conception of moral perfection, which says we do it at the price of two people. And it's really easy to say, no, I wouldn't do that, provided you're not one of the two people. So Mill's utilitarianism is a very interesting, simple, and accessible way of thinking about right and wrong and about politics has much to be said for it. And once you understand its limitations, um, it's really a handy thing to be able to deploy when you're trying to figure out how to get the most, out, uh, the maximum results out of limited resources. All right, thank you so much, Michael. If you wanna Hello? go ahead and unmute and turn your camera on, that would be amazing. It says I can't start the video because my host. Oh, you know what? I apologize for that. Let me fix that right now. Uh, so while I'm fixing that so we can get uh, Michael's camera on, uh, please uh, go ahead and type some of your questions. Uh, and therefore, uh, we can start getting to some of your Q&A during about Mill's utilitarianism. Uh, you should be able to turn your camera okay, on. Okay, there. there I am. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Good morning. Welcome to this lovely May day. Um, so I'm so happy to, to actually talk about this book. I was able to, to do some reading of it. It is, you know, as you said, kind of a pamphlet-sized book. Um, and, and theory and philosophy, I haven't dipped my toes into that for, for quite some time. So uh, I have quite a few questions and I'm hoping our audience does as well. Um, I do have the very first question I'm going to start out with actually came from our registrations. You can always type in questions when you register for the webinar. And this one I found was a very interesting one. Um, how is John Stuart Mills's utilitarianism related to that of utilization focused approaches in program and policy evaluation? It's the grandfather. It's the ancestor of that. In other words, um, the idea of trying to find out on the part of government, you know, programmers or government officials, how many people they're helping and to what extent they're helping um, is a very rational, logical way of deploying scarce resources. So uh, it's, uh, it's, in other words, utilitarianism is alive and well, all right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's utilitarian some of the time. In other words, when we try and figure out how to deploy, say, money for to the CDC, we look for dangerous large-scale uh, diseases. When we try and figure out um, how to deploy money for roads and bridges, we find out where roads and bridges would be most useful to us. We don't just put them up arbitrarily. So um, nobody denies that the utilitarians are onto something. 
what people deny, and I think with good reason, is that the utilitarians have found the silver bullet. See, John Stuart Mill thinks that utilitarianism solves all problems of morals and legislation. And that's famous last words, right? Mm -hmm. People have been looking at it's kind of the holy grail of political and social theory. And people have been looking for it, at it, for it for centuries. So far, they haven't come up with one. But the alternative views are very much worth examining. And utilitarianism is a very handy set of ideas. Okay. And one of the things I did notice, and, and I have this kind of in, as a theme and kind of in some of my questions is, as I was reading it, it seemed like even though he was arguing for utilitarianism is that what sometimes caught me was like he would sit there and argue for pages back and forth as to what what is right and what is wrong like uh, his his fifth chapter about justice is a, is a great example of this is that mm -hmm. it seems like half the time he's arguing for for the theory behind justice and justice for all and you know and, and the other half he's saying but this there is no right justice because how do you you know how do you uh uh, punish the the innocent or punish you know where who gets to decide what the correct punishment is so that it's equal and and, and um fair you know for for everybody so there right. seems to be a lot of back and forth um in that chapter but as well as the book but um how does one decide which course to take i mean could you speak to his back and forth a little bit like is that part of mill's argument is is that there is no right but utility is the easiest thing to think of above all? Well, he's trying to be naturalistic. He wants to derive his morals and his principles of legislation from this worldly secular sources. So while he tacks on that argument about Jesus being utilitarian, in yeah. fact, um, he's trying to break away from inherited traditions, right? So uh, the initial utilitarian comes a generation before mill that's jeremy bentham and mm -hmm. what he's trying to he's swimming upstream against the inherited traditions of say christianity and the uh, moral and political and legal infrastructure built around it but there's also uh uh inherited inequalities like for example the fact that england uh at the time still has a landed aristocracy which is very anomalous but utilitarianism treats aristocrats and common people identically. And that too would have been uh, quite controversial um, because although human equality is embraced up to a point, there's also a point at which uh, um, people differentiate on the basis, for example, of whether they're guilty or innocent of something. Okay, uh, and I have a further question on that one, but first I want to get to some of them that are coming in from our audience members. Uh, so, so keep them coming for sure. The first one is, is there a connection between utilitarianism and critical race theory? They then add, I hope I'm asking that question properly, which which you, you completely yes. put it in the right it's spot. So, yes. It's a very interesting question. And actually know that, well, in a way, critical race theory is the negation of utilitarianism. Here's what this is worth thinking about. It's an interesting question. Um, utilitarianism raises the specter of implementing and institutionalizing the tyranny of the majority. In other words, if you split society up into uh, ninety percent and ten percent groups, and you can do it on the basis of religion or race or a whole collection of things, or, uh, you know, ethnicity, language. Um, under those circumstances, if the 90% of society is really enjoying oppressing the other 10%, um, there may well be a good utilitarian argument for it, right? It just depends on how, on how much pain the 10% are feeling and how much the 90% are grooving on it, right? So um, one of the problems is, is that um, another nightmare case for utilitarianism is that slavery is certainly possible, or say institutionalized inequality is certainly possible, if the people involved in it like it enough, all right, if they have enough of an emotional investment in it. Now, Black, Sli Black Lives Matter is not a utilitarian movement. They're not create, trying to create the, best, the greatest good for the greatest number. As far as I can tell, they're trying to create the greatest good for a small percentage of society, 
right? Uh, something on the order of an eighth or so, even at the cost of greater um, expenditure and greater harm to the remainder of society. In other words, Black Lives Matter is a kind of inverted utilitarianism. Not the, and now the point is, of course, is that um, inverting utilitarianism makes sense under some circumstances. So, so with that though, is that um, one of you kind of led into one of my other questions is as Mill is reaching his conclusion, he states, um, and this is a lengthy quote, the entire history of social improvement has been a series of transitions by which one customer institution uh, after another from being supposed primary necessity of social existence has passed into the rank of universally stigmatized injustice and tyranny. So it sounds like he's arguing against, um, and, and once again, this isn't his justice, it's in the final chapter, it's as he's coming to a conclusion, he goes on to, to list a series of examples such as slaves, slaves versus freemen, patricians versus plebeians, nobles versus serfs, etc. Is this Mill arguing that society, which is justice focused, man-made law focused um, is, you know, will continue to change societal norms since they weren't for the greater good? Or is there another reasoning behind this point? Because kind of to what you just said, it sounds like to a certain extent for a while, they were utilitarian, like, you know, to own slaves was utilitarian because it was for the greater good to own the slaves. And yet it seems he's almost arguing against that fact. Well, you see, the problem is often, remember, Mill is, is writing a kind of popular pamphlet here. Mm -hmm. This is not like a Hegel writing for other scholars. Mill is a popularizer and a pamphleteer writer, um, a pamphleteer. Uh, he is trying to make his argument accessible and he does so um, by enlisting some very unusual utilitarians, right? Jesus, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, when he says that utilitarianism uh, would imp would uh, erode or eliminate slavery, um, he never explains how or why. In other words, I can see how uh, it might if the majority of the society were enslaved. But if the majority is not is enslaved, well, then it's an empirical question of how much the enslavers are enjoying themselves and how much the enslaved are being pained. Now, well, here's one of the funny things. All right. Um, we would love to be able to quantify right and wrong. And that's, the, in a way, the great lure of utilitarianism, right? If you're a general and your army is in danger of being destroyed, if you sacrifice a tenth of the army, that's exactly what you ought to do in order to maintain it. On the other hand, not all circumstances uh, are that would justify that kind of necessity. Um, for example, um, Suppose a society decides that it's in their interest, not just to oppress 10%, but to exterminate 10%. Well, again, um, there's no reason why um, the Holocaust is necessarily inconsistent with uh, utilitarianism. It's all a question of how much the oppressors enjoy oppressing. Now, we would love to be able to produce some mathematics to show that, in fact, the oppressed are always on the good side because they're so unhappy. But there's no reason to believe that. Here's why. Um, there's no such thing as a British happiness unit. In other words, there is no quanta by which we measure happiness. We can measure British thermal units for heat and meters for distance, but we simply don't have any unit for measuring happiness. All right. And in crude ways, like when we say, do I want a tenth of my army destroyed or the or 100%? Yeah, you can make it work there. But there are other situations for which it's not at all clear. Um, how much enjoyment would we get from, say, confiscating all the wealth of all the billionaires in the world? And then the question would be, well, if we would enjoy it, maybe we should do that. But maybe we shouldn't stop at billionaires. Maybe we should confiscate all the property in the world. And then there's the further question of whether we want to judge the outcome in the short term or the long term. In the, in the short term, getting a whole bunch of money in my bank account taken from Bill Gates, that might be a lot of fun. On the other hand, next year when I've spent it and no one wants to try and accumulate that kind of digital money because it only gets taken away, I'm stuck with an internet now in stasis. So again, how do I judge the enjoyment of a big addition to my checking account to having the 
compared to say having the internet develop, um, I don't know what British happiness units we use. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, interesting thought for sure and, and how it goes in. One of the questions that, that came in was how does utilitarianism relate to socialism, which is kind of, you know, you're, you're heading into that direction anyway. So, so would you please uh, enlighten us on that one? Yes, um, utilitarianism can be, uh, can be realized in either a socialist or a capitalist economy. Right. It's just a question of how you allocate pleasure and pain. Now, uh, the kind of, how can I put it, welfare state, it depends on, on whether you regard that as socialism or not. Some people do, some people don't. Um, there's, a, I, I would imagine that there are pretty good arguments, utilitarian, uh, utilitarian arguments for something like a welfare state, something like uh, government provided health care or government provided safety regulations on the job. There probably is a, a good utilitarian argument for that. The question is, how far do you want to push it? And what's your time threshold? Uh, socialist uh, societies are very equal, but they also tend to be rather lacking in dynamism. All right, there's a reason why so many new things come out of Silicon Valley, as opposed to Mongolia or, you know, uh, places where the government controls the economy. So um, utilitarianism is compatible with socialism, but doesn't require it. It seems that, you know, whether it's socialism or communism or, or capitalism, it, it seems like you can pretty much argue that utilitarianism has a place in any type of society, um, which, which leads into one of the questions I, I have for you is, you know, it's, it's one of those factors that where is it? Um, sorry, I'm trying to get to, to the question. I, I, I did notice it's like, how does one decide whose happiness is more important? So, so especially in the first introductory chapter of, of utilitarianism, this question kept popping up in my head in the sense of, you know, like you have to judge the greater good. You have to judge like, does the majority find it happier than a single person? But like, who's determining, like, is it, a, is it a question of the majority? Or once again, if you're going into a government or a political situation, is the government saying, oh, well, the majority is going to feel like this? Cause then you can definitely get into some arguments of our current state of affairs, especially in the US. I know we have people from other worlds so we won't go into that, but you know, like who's decide, deciding and what majority is it? Right, okay. Um, the specter of tyranny of the majority hangs heavy on utilitarianism because it's an essentially egalitarian outlook. In other words, he's assuming that all people's happiness and or pleasure and pain are equally important. Now, you don't have to do that. Um, that's an add-on. You could have something like utilitarianism, but only focused on, uh, on yourself, right? Or only focus, you know, that would make you an, an absolute egoist or only focused on you and a small number of people, say uh, the, remain, the other members of the royal family. Um, that would also be um, a problem for utilitarians, right? They're gonna generally go with the democracy, go with the herd, go with the greatest number. When the numbers start to get similar, say 59 to 41, how can you tell who's in the most pain? Because you only need a slight tweaking of the pain of the 49% to get more pain. See, uh, it, they're trying to create a, a qualitative system, a way of thinking here. It's not so much quantitative, or it's rather, it's quantitative, it's not so much qualitative. And yet, my sense is, being arrested and uh, convicted of being a witch when you're not a witch, that's probably got to be a very unhappy and very terrifying and miserable experience because you get burned to death because people don't like you. Now, there are other systems of morals, say that developed by Kant, which says, look, we don't do that. We never knowingly uh, punish or convict anyone that's innocent. The utilitarian says, well, tell me the background. You know, is it really helpful to kill this person? I mean, is this person important to us? Uh, I know the other thousand people that want to kill them are very important to us. Um, 
she's going to die anyway. She's kind of old and sickly. And these thousand people are going to riot. And I should get 12 or 15 deaths at least. Um, the rational thing to do is to burn the old lady. Other moral traditions say, look, we draw the line there. We don't knowingly do what we know is wrong. And it's wrong to punish the innocent. And that's the end of the discussion. That's one of the reasons why I'd like to do Kant's Foundations of the Metaphysics of Morals. Once I've done utilitarianism, in order to see the, what the other half of the parenthesis looks like, you need to do Kant to say, look, this is, the in, this is utilitarianism, not turned inside out. He doesn't have a problem helping large numbers of people. He says there are lines that utilitarianism crosses that we dare not cross. Okay. And there's a lot, a lot to be said for that. Um, FYI, we, we actually have a question about Kant in here uh, that we'll get to in just a moment. And that's a little plug. We have uh, decided the titles for the rest of the years and, uh, and, and Kant's book is on one of those titles. So, so look forward to that a little bit later this year. So some say, this is a question from, from uh, one of our listeners. Some say there is a fact, uh, sorry, let me start over. Some say there is in fact a utilitarian argument within the Kantian categorical imperative, similar to what you were just talking about. For instance, it is totally possible to imagine a universe where helping other people is not adopted as a maxim. Kant would argue that helping others is a duty, but an imperfect one. It is argued that Kant's justifications for such imperfect duties are better explained by utilitarianism um, than the, the CI, uh, than, than the collective imperative, I think. No, that's categorical the imperative. Categorical imperative. So I was trying to go back up to the question. There we go. What is your answers to such claims? Okay. Um, there are different flavors of utilitarianism, all right? And it's largely developed, strangely enough, in Australia, they took this 19th century British tradition and uh, it became more important in Australian political thought than any place else, right? Someone like Peter Singer, right, is a kind of a hardcore utilitarian. Now, within utilitarians, there are at least two major schools. There are act utilitarians and rule utilitarians. The act utilitarians are pretty simple and straightforward. When you want to know if something is good, you look at the action and you calculate up the British happiness units or the Australian happiness units, and then you choose the one that gives you the most happiness units. Okay, so it's a straightforward optimization activity. It's pretty easy. The more sophisticated version of utilitarianism says, no, we have to step back and see the bigger picture. We're not going to justify our utilitarian calculations simply on the basis of the action, but also on the rule that it instantiates, Let me, which may or may not be consistent with act utilitarian. So let me give you an example. There was a war movie uh, uh, called Black Hawk Down. Mm -hmm. It was uh, some US soldiers that had been working in Ethiopia, I believe, and they were shot down and then they had to send more in to rescue them. And it ended up being a debacle and then a large number of our servicemen got killed. Now, back at the command center, they know that they have a Black Hawk down and they know they have soldiers fighting for their lives. Now, the act utilitarian is utilitarian says, cut your losses, don't be stupid. We're not sending in 50 guys to rescue the half dozen that are here, putting their lives in danger because we're going to end up with more, with more dead people. On the other hand, the rule utilitarian says, we get a very great advantage, all right? We get the greatest good for the greatest number by implementing the rule that we leave no man behind. That means that when our soldiers are dropped anywhere on the planet, they will fight very hard because they know that we got their back. No matter what happens, if there's even one of them there, we will send in the Marines and we will drag them out. So. Here you have utilitarian calculations telling you to do two different things, right? And the more sophisticated version of utilitarianism is this act utilitarianism. In other words, what justifies our rules, like you should tell the truth, is the fact that lying causes more pain than pleasure, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, what this person is doing, and it's a sophisticated move, I, I like this, it's a person with some training, um, they're trying to say that Kant 
who says, look, I don't care what the consequences are. We always do the right thing. And I can explain to you how to do that. What, he, what this person is suggesting is that Kant is in fact a real utilitarian. The reason why Kant likes something called the categorical imperative, which is a, a kind of algorithm which determines the right or wrongness of every possible moral action. I know it sounds impossible, but he actually created such a thing. Um, what they would say is that Kant, you're not really giving us an alternative to utilitarianism. You're giving us a more sophisticated version of it by demanding moral absolutes. But these moral absolutes are all implicitly justified by the fact that the rules create the greatest good for the greatest number. So again, it's a, it's a long and winding road by which we bring Kant and other critics of utilitarianism back to utilitarianism by claiming that they're act rather than rule utilitarians. That's an interesting take. I mean, and it just shows the difference between like philosophy and thought process is that it seems that no matter what philosophy I've read, no matter uh, what philosopher I've read, they all they always argue or seem to argue for just theirs, but yet most of the world utilizes a combination of various forms of philosophy and well, theory. Well, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I, when I taught the history of philosophy, I, you know, I would start with the ancient Greeks and Aristotle has some good things to say about ethics and so does Kant and so does Mill and so does John Rawls for that matter. And uh, while all of them have something to contribute, none of them ever achieved that hoped for silver bullet. What you should think of when you're dealing with things like utilitarianism or Aristotelian ethics or Kantian ethics, think of yourself as a tradesman with a bunch of tools in his bag. What you need to know, what, what knowing a trade involves, is knowing what tool to use at what particular juncture. In other words, not every one of these rules is properly deployed under every circumstance, right? And that involves having good judgment. And that's something, for, unfortunately, we're never gonna be able to dispense with. No. Uh, shifting gears slightly, uh, there's an interesting question here. Do you know if Mills ever, if Mill ever spoke about continuing Bentham's tradition of concern for animals? Uh, yes. Um, all of the uh, English or Anglophone tradition is going to base its judgment of good and evil on pleasure and pain. Mm -hmm. And animals are just as capable of feeling pleasure and pain as human beings. Now, I, I imagine, or, or at least I assume that there's some sort of drop off, that the pain of a dog has more in common with human pain than, say, the pain of an amoeba. I don't exactly know what amoeba pain would be like. I actually don't even know if there is such a thing. I mean, they're pretty primitive. But the idea is this. If pleasure and pain are good and evil, then we will have some reason to include all sentient beings. And that's why someone, a utilitarian like Peter Singer is so heavily involved in animal rights. So my question for this is like, there's um, some of the papers I read about uh, utilitarianism and then also, um, you know, Mill goes into depth, especially in the beginning on the comparison of swine um, that, you know, like a lot of people gave um, Mill a hard time or gave him grief of, of like, you're only compa you're comparing us to base animals, you're comparing us to this because we're only in search of pleasure or pain. And yet in the comparison to swine, Mill seems to relate that we are above the base animals because we can choose the best course of action. But in a way the base animal is right since they are seeking happiness. Can you go into further depth on this sure. comparison and sure. if the individualistic view of a base animal is what Mills was arguing for, or if he was arguing because we actually have the ability to choose the greater happiness versus individual happiness? Right. There's an ancient maxim from Greco-Roman philosophy. Better Socrates unsatisfied than an ox satisfied, right? Because the... Uh, the pleasures or happiness of an ox are taken to be inferior to those of a human being. And uh, yeah, I think that speciesism in the sense, you know, a term from Peter Singer, in the sense that I value human life more than I value the lives of amoebas or dogs. Um, yeah, I think that everybody or almost everybody has an intuitive inclination that way. 
that if you prefer the life of an amoeba to that of a person, there's something wrong with that. Fair enough. On the other hand, um, just because a dog is not the moral equivalent of a, of a child, and I know that there are some people who hold it that view that they are, I don't share that view, and I think that very few uh, ordinary people do. It doesn't mean that they have animus or want to harm animals, but human beings come first. Um, it's not clear what the utilitarian uh, justification for that would be. In other words, um, it connects to what Mill says at the end that um, there, are, there are degrees of pleasure and that the best developed mind is the one that understands intellectual pleasures, which are better than the base uh, animal pleasures that we share with other vertebrates. So uh, he's going to argue for a degree for a question for a difference in quality for pleasures that are accessible to rational minds like human beings. So what that means is that other minds, which are sentient but can't reason, are less important but not irrelevant to our moral calculations. But here we're I mean again, this is a bluff. If you want to give human beings a full one BHU and you want to give animals at various degrees of sentience, uh, 0.75 for dogs and 0.6 for, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever else, lizards, and then 0.1 for amoebas. Um, does that really mean that if you have enough amoebas, they're more important than people? Or yeah. suppose you could live the life of a mollusk, a clam at the bottom of the ocean. And suppose you, should, you could be able to live unmolested and have a very happy mollusk life. Um, is there a point if you live long enough where your mollusk happiness outweighs the much shorter, briefer happiness of a human life? In other words, would you be better off being a clam? I don't know. This is a tr th these are tricky utilitarian problems to which ordinary people have an immediate and obvious answer. No, I don't want to be a clam. <laughs> no, dogs aren't as important as people, but I don't want anybody to torture them. Got it. No, I appreciate that. It was one of those that like stuck out to me and especially because it comes up in a lot of papers too about utilitarianism and the comparison yeah. to animal. So we're running out of time, but I do have one more question from the audience. Um, would you consider, and I'm hopefully not going to butcher this author's name, would you consider um, if Jenny Zemutin's novel We as oh, the critique of utilitarianism. If so, how effective of a critique is it? I'm not as familiar with that book. Okay, that's a wonderful choice. Zamyatin was a Russian author who wrote about political, uh, wrote about a political dystopia. I think the book was written in, in 1929, and both Orwell and uh, uh, who else am I thinking of Brave New World, Huxley, uh, had Huxley, access yeah. to it, okay? Uh, what he said, what Zamyatin said in We, is that what, what Soviet society was trying to do was abolish the individual. So there's, there's no I anymore, it's only we. And that kind of abolition of the individual um, is uh, a danger that you have in, util in strictly utilitarian calculations right? If everybody's equally important, well, then you just plug in the numbers and you come up with the answer. But I'm not certain that in every case, everybody is equally important. We might, for example, make distinctions between those that had the opportunity to avoid an evil and those that have it imposed on them without any choice, right? So, uh, for example, we might uh, want to spend more time on uh, young people than old people, I think in, in, uh, offer, in, in offering medical care, for example, um, it might make more sense in a utilitarian view to spend more money on young people because they have a longer potential life. And that would tend towards inegalitarianism, right? Okay. So that it's an egalitarian base, but it's not 100% uh, committed to that at all times. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. So thank you um, for your time today, Michael. I'm glad it worked out. Uh, sorry for the bumpy, bumpy start there, but it was a great conversation. No, I appreciate I it. I the link, and once I did, I was okay. Wonderful. Um, and then 
For those who are still with us, um, if you're enjoying the Classics Revisited series with Professor Sigru, uh, we are continuing the series this year with our next webinar being on May 25th. We're gonna actually dive right back into the dystopian uh, futures uh, with a clockwork orange, uh, Anthony Burgess says, and we're also gonna be doing uh, Brave New World in June. After that, uh, we do have six more novels uh, or six more books. We're gonna start getting into some of the big books, but one of them is uh, the, the Kant book uh, that, that the professor recommended earlier today that we'll be diving into as well. All of our classics revisited series with the professor are available on YouTube. This allows you to share the webinars with other staff as well as your patrons uh, who may be interested in learning about these great titles. If the dates and times do not work for you, they are always recorded on demand on YouTube, as I said. Um, and you can also visit uh, biblioteca.com to share those resources that we shared in the chat. Um, also, be sure to su subscribe at the bottom of the Biblioteca homepage to receive future information about any upcoming webinars that we have. We do also have quite a few webinars um, on demand and a number of webinars coming up um, in our regular series that are customer based. Finally, as you log off today, uh, we would love everybody to complete a quick survey to see how you enjoyed our work uh, break with the classics. If you have any questions, title suggestions, please leave them in the follow-up survey that will pop up as you log off. And with that, uh, from everyone here at Biblioteca, as well as uh, the professor, thank you for joining us. And thank you once again, Michael, for leading today's discussion. Have a thank great you. day, everybody.